Good afternoon. My name is Mary Ann Farkas, and along with my co-presenter, Cheryl Gagney, we're going to spend the next hour talking about a primer on the psychiatric rehabilitation process. And I want to welcome all of you in the audience to this afternoon's presentation. Our agenda for the next hour is as follows. I'm going to start with an introduction to the primer itself, defining psychiatric rehabilitation. Then Dr. Gagne is going to talk about the actual process of psychiatric rehabilitation, followed by myself discussing the implications for developing a psychiatric rehabilitation program. We're going to end the session with 10 minutes of question and answers. So thank you for your participation. Let's start with the idea of psychiatric rehabilitation. There's been a lot of progress in this field over the last 30 years. We've developed a philosophy, a set of principles, a set of values. There's been research done on psychiatric rehabilitation. Model programs have been developed. And there's a technology to deliver psychiatric rehabilitation. And all of that has happened in the last 30 years. In addition, the idea of recovery has become accepted. Recovery as the process of regaining a meaningful life is accepted not only in the United States but internationally as the common goal of all mental health services. Clearly, psychiatric rehabilitation services are one of an array of services that can contribute to recovery or not, depending on the principles, values, and competencies which, with which they are delivered. So, a psychiatric rehabilitation service is one that is focused on recovery, or the notion of regaining a meaningful life. It's one of an array of services, such as treatment, crisis intervention, case management, peer support, wellness services, etc. And each of these services has a specific intended outcome. For example, rehabilitation services has as its intended outcome the development of valued role functioning. In other words, if rehabilitation services are delivered effectively, people will improve in terms of their valued role functioning. In terms of a treatment service, the outcome that is intended is the reduction of symptoms and distress. This is an important point because sometimes people get confused about the kinds of services that are available in a mental health service system and understand it to be anything that you do that is good service. However, when you specify the intended outcome of each service, you ensure that all levels of outcome are attended to and that together they are integrated by focusing on the vision of recovery or the purpose of regaining a meaningful life. So rehabilitation, first of all, is defined by its intended outcome. That is, its job is to help people regain a valued role. Why did we develop this primer? As I said before, the field has developed many program models, such as Fountain House or Clubhouses, assertive community treatment programs, integrated placement and service programs, or supported employment programs. And the process, that is the interaction between the person and a facilitator or helper, regardless of the model in which the helper is working, is really not as well understood as the program models. In other words, there's a lot been written about the kind of structure, the kind of teamwork, the kind of uh, staffing that has to occur in order for the program models to be delivered. Very little is understood about the actual process of psychiatric rehabilitation that has to occur within the boundaries of these program models. The primer, therefore, was written by Dr. William Anthony and myself to help clear up the confusion that exists in the field about the fundamental process of psychiatric rehabilitation. Uh, I'd like to turn the uh, podium over to Dr. Cheryl Gagney, and I realize that we never started with an introduction of who we were. <laughs> so maybe uh, this is a moment to do so. I am the Director of Training, Dissemination, and Technical Assistance at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, where Dr. William Anthony is the Executive Director. This uh, center has been in operation for the past 
30 some odd years focused on the mandate of developing new knowledge and uh, in the area of working with people with serious psychiatric disabilities and then translating that new knowledge into tools that could be used by the field and researching its impact. So my colleague, Dr. Cheryl Gagne, is the Associate Director of Services at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation and also a training, a senior, rather, training associate. Cheryl. Thank you, Mary Ann. So I'm going to speak to you about the psychiatric rehabilitation process. That is what a practitioner does in partnership with an individual or group of individuals who has psychiatric uh, disability. Uh, Mary Ann told you that I am the associate director of the Recovery Center, which is our services branch here at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. Every week, 120 or so adults who live in the greater Boston area come to the center to participate in recovery education classes. Some of these classes are focused in, on um, rehabilitation and use the principles and practices of psychiatric rehabilitation. We also have a large number of people who receive, participate in individual services. So folks who are hoping to choose, get, and keep a meaningful role in their lives. People going back to school, going back to work, um, thinking about moving, um, looking at their overall wellness in terms of enhancing their physical wellness so that they can achieve a goal that they have. Um, so that said, um, you know, my, my um, role is split very much between training, where I train uh, both nationally and internationally. I've taught here at Boston University um, in the Rehabilitation Counseling Department, the course Psychiatric Rehabilitation, and the day-to-day -day delivery of psychiatric rehabilitation services. So I'll talk about the process, and I'm going to begin by talking about psychiatric rehabilitation as an evidence-based process. We hear a lot in the field about evidence-based uh, programs and practices. The process is the actual um, activities and tasks that the practitioner does in concert, in partnership with the program participant. Um, and research tells us very strongly that change is more likely, and this uh, cuts across all groups of people, change is more likely uh, to be successful in the context of a positive relationship. Um, it's more likely to be successful if the person sets his or her own goals. Um, change processes are more successful when the person is taught skills that enhance their ability to be successful and satisfied in the new goal environment. Change is also more positive if the person receives support. And in psychiatric rehabilitation, we look at support as any person, place, thing, or activity that helps us function better in our roles. Um, change is also more likely to be positive if the person has positive expectations, some belief in himself or in the world that the future holds something good, and that the person believes in his or her own self-efficacy. These last two factors um, we'll address when we talk about rehabilitation readiness. Um, these are the core ingredients, uh, make up many of the core ingredients of the psychiatric rehabilitation process. And as you were listening, you probably noted that many of these, these factors are true for all of us, that these, these things about change, um, that change is more likely, these are the key ingredients for all of us when we've made changes. And part of the psychiatric rehabilitation process um, ideally normalizes the experience of rehabilitation and change for people who are living with psychiatric disabilities. Now, now we're going to talk about you, the practitioner, and the critical um, ingredients, the things that, the characteristics that you possess as a psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner that facilitate change in another person. Um, many of these characteristics you have been taught during your university experience. Um, certainly listening skills and connecting skills, 
um, that are also known as engaging skills. All those interpersonal skills that you bring to the table. Um, the next one is more a philosophical stance, that there's deep respect for the person's um, expertise, that you as a, as a rehabilitation uh, practitioner have expertise, but that the person coming to you also has expertise. They're experts in their own lives. Um, in addition to those kind of core interpersonal skills, teaching skills, inspiring skills are critically important. In rehabilitation, we spend much time teaching people um, new ideas, attitudes, knowledge, um, and skills. And if you didn't know, if you didn't think about inspiration as a skill, I'm here to tell you that it, it, it indeed is a skill. There are ways in which we can uh, inspire people to strengthen their belief in the future and their beliefs in themselves. And I think finally, a characteristic that I've uh, uh, begun to develop early in my career and continually try to focus on is the, is the characteristic of humility, the deep recognition that I still have a lot to learn. So often in my work, uh, my greatest teachers are the people who come to me to participate in psychiatric rehabilitation uh, process. I've learned everything about uh, what it takes to uh, persevere in difficult times. And I've also learned a lot about um, geology, for example, when I supported a man getting his master's degree in geology. I learned a lot more about rocks than I ever knew there was to learn. Um, and so this humility, when we bring that to the table, means that we, too, are teachable. Um, the psychiatric rehabilitation process is one of diagnosis, planning, and intervention. And at any given moment, we can um, we can know where we are in the process. You know, we can, we can point to this is what we're working on. And we do make this process um, very obvious for the person. By diagnosis, I'm really talking about all of those uh, assessments or evaluations that we do together, that I do in partnership with the participant, um, that provide information on, you know, where do we begin and what needs to happen. In planning, we just simply set priorities and select interventions and schedule interventions. We may establish some timelines together. And then the interventions in psychiatric rehabilitation are largely educational, experiential kinds of activities where we, ha we um, either teach skills or accompany people through essential experiences that they need to learn more about themselves or more about the work. The other major intervention is helping a person access the supports or resources that he needs to succeed. I'm going to walk through this process in a little bit more detail. Um, and one of the ways, I'll be showing some slides as I do that, but you also have your primer. And I'll point to different pages in the primer that you can turn to and see sort of a live example of what that looks like on paper. Uh, it's not the same as you know, meeting with someone and having it done um, uh, in, in real life, but it gives you some picture of what each piece of the process might look like. Um, and the piece that you'll see is the final product of the work together. So we're going to begin by looking at assessing readiness for psychiatric rehabilitation. Assessing readiness for psychiatric rehabilitation is simply a person answering the question, am I willing to participate in a structured process of change? This is a heavy question for many people. Uh, change requires uh, a large commitment of uh, time, resources, and effort. Um, and the person who is asking himself the question is assisted by the practitioner by helping the person first look at his or her need for change. Need for change most commonly has to do with a person's dissatisfaction with the way things are currently. Am I hap unhappy being unemployed? Am I unhappy uh, living at home with my mom? 
and dad. As a rehabilitation practitioner, I listen for dissatisfaction, and to me, it's like someone opening the door for me, because often that's where change begins. Again, for all of us, change begins with dissatisfaction. Other times, a person it has a need for change because of his or her lack of success in a particular environment. Things aren't going well, and so they may need to look at making some changes, either to leave the current environment or to stay and make some changes in himself or herself. Um, and so, but any process of change, whether it's making a dramatic change um, in, as moving into your own apartment or uh, beginning at university or something more subtle like learning interpersonal skills to be more successful at the job is a, is a um, it's a big investment of time and effort. And so the person begins by asking, am I willing? So first there needs to be a need for change. Without a need for change, we generally don't think about moving forward. If it's not broke, we don't fix it. Um, the second thing we help a person look, look at is his or her commitment to change. And this is a, um, composed really of um, assessing the person's belief um, that change is desirable for him, that things will be better. I do the cost-benefit analysis, and I decide, you know what, I have more to gain than lose, um, and that change is supported. Um, we then assess a person's self-awareness and environmental awareness. How much does the person know about himself or herself and the world out there in order to make good uh, choices to set good goals, we really need to know about who we are and what's on the menu out there. What are the options for us? We also spend some time um, looking at the relationship the pr between the practitioner and the participant. How close are we? Is this an effective working relationship? Do I understand as a practitioner how best to connect with them? Um, and in the end, we choose a direction, and that might be to proceed with, with rehabilitation. It might be to spend some time developing readiness. And you can see in uh, Robert's example, I believe, he has chosen that um, a little bit of readiness development might be ideal for him. Um, the next uh, step in the process is setting that overall rehabilitation goal. This really dictates what we're going to do together in terms of interventions. The person asks himself or herself the question, where do I want to live, learn, work, or socialize, both successfully and happily, in the next 6 to 24 months? Um, so the answer to that question, um, simple question, is it uh, may take some time in helping the person identify what are my criteria for choosing? What's important? Um, what's out there for me in the world? And putting that information together to choose a goal. Um, and you can look on page 36 of Robert's example of uh, his overall rehabilitation goal. He was choosing a place to live. He identified down the left column his criteria and across the top the options that were out there for him. And he and his practitioner did research to come up with the goal. I believe it was Bay State Apartments he would move into. Um, once that goal is chosen, then all of the activities, uh, the remaining activities in rehabilitation, revolve around that goal. What does Robert need to do or have to be successful and satisfied? Um, first, uh, the functional assessment. What do I need to be able to do well in order to be successful and satisfied in my goal environment? Um, and the answer to that question is, is um, comes from the functional assessment. The practitioner and the participant um, look together at, well, what are the most critical skills and how well am I able to perform those? Um, the resource assessment answers the question, what are the things, or what are the people, places, and things I need to have in order to be successful and satisfied in my goal environment? What are the resources that are going to make the difference for me? Um, again, on page 38, you can see Robert's example, that they've listed a few resources that Robert and his practitioner found as critical or necessary for his success in his own apartment. 
um, they then evaluate together Robert's whether those those are available to him and is he able to use those resources. Once the functional assessment is done, we're, we've really completed the diagnostic phase of psychiatric rehabilitation, although we can think about this phase as continuing as new information comes up. Uh, planning is simply creating a detailed scheme of how you're going to acquire those needed skills and resources to be successful and satisfied. You know, how are we going to do it? How are we going to accomplish it? What are the interventions we're going to do? Who is going to do it? Um, you know, the person himself, the practitioner, um, other service providers, family, friends. We try to pull in a whole team of people, if available, to help Robert acquire the skills and supports. Um, the plan should have uh, details of what you're going to do. And then finally, how you're going to accomplish this. There was a question about these, um, these forms and worksheets about whether they'll be changed and uh, that was a question that came from one of the students there and in fact they're changed all the time. These are simply examples. Practitioners and uh, participants are encouraged to tailor it to make it their own. We give examples so that people can see what are the, the necessary information that might go on this plan but to create it so that it works for both the practitioner and the participant. Um, so uh, forms are changed all the time. Planning, we th planning made me think of forms because that's often where we do a lot of our documenting is through the rehabilitation planning, although um, we also do documentation through uh, diagnosis and intervention. Um, interventions, um, psychiatric rehabilitation interventions fall into two categories. The first are skill development interventions and that might be, those are direct skills teaching and that is instructing and practicing skills that the person doesn't yet know how to do. Uh, if you discover the person does not know how to say create a daily um, activity plan, then the practitioner would actually teach the person how to do that. Um, more commonly, uh, the person knows how to do a skill, but for some reason doesn't do it as needed in the environment of need. And that's where skill programming comes in, um, overcoming barriers to using skills as needed. A good example in our lives is flossing our teeth. We've taught that skill many times by our dental hygienist, but we have to overcome barriers to doing that, performing that skill as often as required. Things get in the way sometimes, we forget. Um, resource development interventions are those interventions where we uh, try to help the person get acquired, uh, needed uh, resources. And there are really three different kinds of that. The first is perhaps the simple of just coordinating services and supports that the person has easy access to, whether that's a job coach or um, uh, a bus pass, easy access to that. Um, resource modification we do. Um, when we have to tailor the support or resource, it exists out there, the support or service exists, it doesn't quite fit our, our uh, uh, participants need and so we have to make some adaptations to it so that the person can use it well. Um, and I think from Robert's example we had uh, Robert as a needed resource had um, a fitness partner. Um, that was, in a, that was in a, a, a resource that needed to be modified to meet Robert's need. And resource creation, this is when you're out there inventing your own supports and, and services, thinking really outside the box and inventing um, a resource that perhaps does not exist yet in the mental health system. So I've, I've walked you through very quickly the psychiatric rehabilitation process. Um, Mary Ann's gonna come back and talk about different program models um, and different ways of, of implementing this, this process in many different programs. So I'm going to end here. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. So we've been talking um, up till now about the process that happens between the person who is looking for a valued role in society 
and the person who is facilitating that process or helping that person achieve a valued role in society. And it occurs to me that perhaps the word valued role in society might be a little obscure. And when we say that, we mean a role like worker, student, homemaker, family member. Those are the kinds of valued roles that we're talking about. So what is a program? Developing a coherent, processed, focused program is what we try to do in psychiatric rehabilitation. What do we mean by that? We mean that we develop a program structure whose aim is to promote a specific process. And this could be true for many different kinds of processes. The program structure needs to promote the process between the practitioner and the client. And what are some of the elements of a program or an agency that can be used to promote that process? The mission of a program, the environment that has a particular culture, a particular physical location, a network of services, some policies, procedures, activities, record keeping. These elements can be organized in a straightforward way to serve the institution's needs, or it can be organized in a way that promotes a specific process of helping. When we talk about psychiatric rehabilitation, we're talking about organizing these elements of an organization to promote the DPI process that Cheryl mentioned before. So when we talk about organizing a service process, we talk about elements that help to the, the service to assess, evaluate, monitor, estimate, judge, analyze, draw a conclusion. Any of those kinds of activities are what we mean by the diagnostic phase of a program. And you can use that within the context of psychiatric rehabilitation, as Cheryl has described to you, or you could use it in the context of treatment or case management or peer provider services, actually. All services can be organized in this fashion of thinking about what has to happen to promote a diagnosis or an assessment, what has to happen to promote a plan, what has to happen to promote an intervention. Okay. So for psychiatric rehabilitation programs, we're looking at the critical indicators that the process of DPI, diagnosis, planning, and intervention, is being delivered through these elements of the program that I've talked about, mission, environment, policies, procedures, et cetera. And if you look at page 32 within the primer, you'll see a table that describe these indicators not in terms of units of service, which is a typical kind of indicator used by organizations to monitor and track its performance, but by the kind of component of psychiatric rehabilitation that that particular structure um, promotes. So, for example, if we stay with readiness assessment, you'll see on page 32 that we're looking for evidence that all persons are helped to assess themselves in terms of their need for rehabilitation, their commitment to change, their personal closeness, their awareness of themselves and the environment. And the reason we're looking for this evidence within an organizational context is simply because that's the process between the helper and the person who is seeking uh, psychiatric rehabilitation or seeking to achieve a particular valued role. Okay, so how do we put these pieces together and why is this important? I think someone uh, who sent a question ahead of time asked this question. It's important because, at, not to repeat myself, many programs agencies, if you like, are organized around regulations and processes dictated by the particular governments or counties that they're in, and they're uh, focused in a very generic way to produce certain units of service. What's important in the kind of programs that we help people develop in the United States, in Canada, Europe, really in countries around the world, are processes within the organization that will support an individual going through the diagnosis, planning, and intervention phase 
to achieve a valued role. So just as a reminder, what is that process we're trying to support? These are the major elements, starting to first help someone determine if I am ready to begin. And second, the diagnostic phase, choosing where and in what role I want to live, learn, work, or socialize in the next six to 24 months, assessing what my skills and resource strengths and deficits are to do that role. So I'm not just interested in assessing what I can't do, but I'm also interested in assessing what I can do, and not just what I don't have, but also what I do have, so that I can build upon my strengths to achieve that valued role. And the intervention is intervening to improve the skills and resources that I need to achieve that valued role. So that's the process that we're trying to help the program organize itself to deliver. Okay. So if we take a particular example, again, that of readiness assessment, and I remind you that the readiness assessment is the process of determining how willing and prepared a person is to participate in a structured process beginning with choosing a valued role, then we ask ourselves the following kinds of questions. Is there a policy that supports the process of determining whether or not I'm ready? A policy might be something like each service participant will have the opportunity and the support to assess and decide if they are currently ready to begin rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, as Cheryl pointed out, is a partnership of the practitioner and the individual seeking the valued role. And so the role of the practitioner in this partnership is to facilitate that individual figuring it out for themselves in a structured way. So the policy sets the tone for the organization reflecting a particular component of psychiatric rehabilitation. So what about procedures? Procedures are how we do things around here. And if we're focused on rehabilitation readiness, we're going to look at programs, procedures, to deliver this particular component. So, for example, does each servant's participant get offered the opportunity to join a class, for example, that presents the factors of readiness that Cheryl talked about and provides exercises that allow a person to walk through the steps of readiness assessment and determine if he or she is ready at this point? And why is that important? Because if there is no procedure, and we just walk up to someone and we say, okay, now we're going to do uh, rehabilitation readiness assessment. What do you think about your readiness to begin rehabilitation? The usual response we will get probably is, I don't know. The organization has to provide opportunities in a structured way that allow people to go through each of those factors and figure out for themselves where they stand relative to those factors. Okay, what about recording a rehabilitation program, which is another element that I talked about in, in terms of program structure. The difference between tracking and recording is very important to figure out. Tracking lets you know that a process is occurring. And most record-keeping systems actually focus on tracking, simply knowing does the process occur or not, if they are doing a good job, I mean the tracking system. Recording, on the other hand, lets you know what progress is occurring in the process. So not just is the process occurring, is readiness assessment happening in the organization, but recording lets you know is the person making progress relative to this particular component. So recording psychiatric rehabilitation processes can help administrators understand the structures that need to be in place to support the service delivery. If you look again at page 25 of the primer, you'll see an example of the kind of record keeping that happens with respect to this component of rehabilitation readiness. You will see on page 25 that there is a way to rate the, pers the strength of the person's need, commitment to change, personal closeness, self-awareness, and environmental awareness. Why? Because those are the important factors in rehabilitation readiness. And there has to be a way not only to record that those processes happened, but also where the person is relative to each of those elements. So to summarize what I was saying 
in this particular segment. There are psychiatric rehabilitation programs around the world at this point in time, and their function is to support the delivery of the psychiatric rehabilitation process. The elements that are in place in an organization to do that are the mission of the organization, the policies of the organization, the procedures, activities, and the record keeping system. We usually think of record keeping as a very dry topic, but when you're trying to develop and promote psychiatric rehabilitation, record keeping is the tool that we use to integrate all of these activities and to ensure that not only are people getting the processes that they need to go through the psychiatric rehabilitation flow, but they are also progressing as they go through those various components. So with that, let me just conclude, and then we can go to questions and answers. And the conclusion is that psychiatric rehabilitation is simple to explain. That is, it is a process of engaging a person in a partnership to choose the valued roles that person wants in society, figure out what skills and resources they need to get them, and then teach or support the use of skills or link with resources to achieve the roles. It's pretty simple to explain what the psychiatric rehabilitation process is. But remember, we started this session by saying that there is a lot of confusion in the field. Why? Because it is more complex to deliver this simple process than it is to explain it. We know that psychiatric rehabilitation has a significant empirical base at this point in time. There's been research to demonstrate its effectiveness. It can be implemented by different people in different settings and programs. That is, it can be implemented by peer providers, it can be implemented by the person themselves in a self-help group, it can be implemented in a professional clinic kind of setting. It has been implemented in several countries. It can be implemented through a structured environment as well as purposeful activities either by an individual with lived experience, him or herself, or more often facilitated by another person. In other words, you can shape up an organizational envir environment to create the process of psychiatric rehabilitation, or you can focus on the process of the individual delivering that service. But in either case, at the bottom line is that that individual has to be able to go through some steps to figure out what kind of valued role they want, what they have and don't have to get them there, and then to get some help to overcome the things they don't have. And we know that psychiatric rehabilitation can be both tracked and recorded. With these kinds of elements in place, we should be able to reduce the confusion in the field about what the process of psychiatric rehabilitation is. So now I'd like to turn, turn to some of your questions that were sent in uh, via email and answer those. And I want to ask Cheryl if she'd like to start the question and answer session. We have like five minutes. Okay. There are a couple of questions that I looked at and saw maybe I didn't address this well enough. Um, or even if I did address it, um, it bears uh, more emphasis. And two of the questions, I'm going to put them out and answer the questions together. The first was, do all patients in psychiatric rehabilitation go through all three steps of diagnosis, planning, and intervention? How can you be sure as a professional that your client has spent enough time in each particular step and is ready for the next step? Um, I want to make the point that this is a partnership throughout. Um, there's information being passed between the practitioner and the, uh, the participant. And so that, that there's mutual agreement as we move forward. Um, not all people go through all three steps in the same amount of time. I've worked with people who come into my office and say, help me, I think I'm losing my job. And we might do a real, you know, start right on the, um, functional assessment. You know, her goal is to keep the job that she has and uh, look very closely at what are the skills and supports she needs. We don't need to make uh, much work out of assessing readiness at this point. Um, so people might start in different places. They let you know where they need to begin. Um, so it is about partnership. Um, 
And I did want to make that, po that point throughout that, that this is in concert together. People work together, um, practitioner and participant. The other question that had a, a similar to do uh, with it, um, while psychiatric rehabilitation must um, learn the correct steps, this is the question I'm reading, while the psychiatric rehabilitation counselor must learn the correct steps to ensure accuracy in the process of diagnosing, is it beneficial to be, to allow the consumer to be aware of everything you do? Um, the question is a little bit longer, but it's not so much an issue of allowing. This is, again, partnership. I think of my goal, my job as a rehabilitation counselor is to work myself out of a job, to make myself obsolete, yes, to teach the process that we're going through so that the person can then go forward and perhaps, you know, the next time or the next time or the next time set a goal without the help of a rehabilitation counselor. Um, so I try to make the process as transparent as possible, um, that I'm teaching the process as well as um, moving toward an outcome. Um, so um, for me, that's the spirit of rehabilitation, is to work myself out of a job. Um, and I'm happy to say that I've made myself obsolete in the lives of many people I've worked with over the past 20 years, that, that they now understand enough about themselves, enough about the reha rehabilitation process to go forward and even, you know, assess their own function in a, in a particular role. Um, and when they need to learn something new, know how to access um, that information. So I think I'll let Mary Ann come up and, and address a couple questions that have perhaps more to do with program and system. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'll answer a few questions and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, several of the questions that we received had a similar thrust to it and so I'm going to summarize those. Uh, and they're in the nature of the paperwork. You know, is it hard to keep track of the paperwork as it gets passed around? Do you have to track every client or just some clients? Do you need to do all the re record keeping or just some of the record keeping? How detailed should the record keeping be? And I, I did want to address the, this sort of record keeping issue. In typical service programs, record keeping has been a burden for the practitioner and its main function has been supervisory and billing in the sense that we keep records in order to be able to identify how many units of service have been delivered so that we can get reimbursement for the organization. And obviously getting reimbursement for the organization is important. However, in the psychiatric rehabilitation program, the main purpose of record keeping is so that the person themselves can understand how they are progressing through the process. The record keeping is done as part of the interaction between the provider and the participant, the person with the lived experience. The worksheets that you see in the primer are part and parcel of the conversation that occurs between those two people. So it's not something that happens afterwards, after hours, um, in sort of a, a, a quick duplicate form for the main file that the individual never sees. Often what we do is we give a copy of what we're doing to the person themselves so that they can think about it or do a homework assignment related to it or come back the next day and do the next part. So you have to think of the record keeping within the psychiatric rehabilitation process as a tool that helps the process keep moving rather than a bureaucratic piece of paper. In terms of is it hard to keep track of, since each component of the rehabilitation process is distinct and answers a distinct question, it's less confusing to individuals, including the practitioners delivering the service, than it might be if, again, the purposes were purely administrative. So that's about the form. How much detail is on the form really has to do with what serves the process and what serves the individual that is in that particular process at that particular time. For some people, a lot of detail is very important, otherwise they don't understand what's going on. And for other people, a lot of detail is too much and they glaze over. 
And since the purpose of the form is to serve the individual, the level of detail varies from one to the next. Um, another question that was asked that has to do more with recovery per se uh, was a series of questions such as, what is the most essential service um, for the majority of people with mental illness in a recovery-oriented system and why, or, um, yeah, is there really a difference between psychiatric rehabilitation and other kinds of mental health services? Or another question, which is, uh, can progress be made in the long, long run to offset mental illness as people become more and more mentally ill? So I want to kind of collect those questions and uh, respond to them as a group. First of all, the notion of recovery, as I said uh, at the beginning of my talk, is well accepted in most countries at this point in time. And what do we know about recovery? We know that one half to two thirds of the group of people who have a diagnosis of serious mental illness, in particular schizophrenia at this point, recover from that mental illness. They recover, that means that their symptoms are reduced, they are taking few to no medications, they have reintegrated with their families, and they report a satisfactory level of quality of life. These studies have been replicated in many countries, such as Japan and Germany and Switzerland and in the United States. And the follow-up periods of time for these studies are somewhere between 25 to 37 years in in length. In other words, when you follow people for 25 to 37 years, half to two-thirds of the group actually improve and recover, regain a meaningful life, as opposed to becoming more and more mentally ill or deteriorating um, over time, which is what we used to think in the past. So I want to lay that to rest, first of all. Second of all, what are the important services in a recovery-oriented service for one individual are not what the important services are for another individual. If you think about your own life and what it takes for you to struggle with meaning in your life and figuring out how to achieve a meaningful life, I'm sure that if you look around the room, each person in that room has a different path and a different way of achieving meaning. Not only a different way of defining it, but a different way of achieving it. So, for some people, one service is more important at one point in time, another service is more important at another point in time. There is no stereotypic, stip, uh, let me try that again. There is no stereotypic way that people recover, and therefore there are no set menus of services that are important to everyone with psychiatric uh, disabilities. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to uh, respond perhaps to uh, a couple of more questions, and then we will wrap it up. Um, I think the only other question that I really want to uh, respond to here is this question about, do foreign countries have anything set up like this? I've said several times within this uh, lecture that there are psychiatric rehabilitation programs uh, in many countries around the world. In fact, Cheryl Gagne and myself travel around the world helping programs in different countries um, become implemented and improved relative to psychiatric rehabilitation and recovery. And what we do is we adapt the basic process that we've explained to you here today and make it culturally relevant and realistic for countries like Singapore or Australia um, in which the services are different than in the United States or Canada or Spain or England. So these cult programs can be made culturally specific, but the core processes are always the same. There is always a methodology that helps people determine whether or not they are willing and prepared to become engaged in a process like this. The diagnostic pieces are always the same, helping people choose the valued role, figure out what their skills and resources are that they need to achieve that valued role. There is a plan, and the interventions are always about improving skills and supports. So having said all of that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And on behalf of Dr. Gagne and myself, uh, just express the, our pleasure at having the opportunity to talk to you and 
hope to talk to you in the future.